A good afternoon and welcome to this ArtNet uh, webinar. My name is Francesco M and I'm speaking from my office in Rome. Um, as always, before starting, let me remind you that your microphones are turned off, but that during and after the webinar, you can send your question through the GoToWebinar application that appears on your screen. I will ask your question at the end of the presentation and the webinar will last approximately 30 minutes today. We will then have um, roughly 15 minutes available for questions. Our speaker today is Professor Olivia Boyer. Olivia is a pediatric nephrologist at Necker Enfant Malade Hospital, and she's a full professor of pediatric at the University uh, uh, de Paris in France. After her training in Paris, she completed a clinical research fellowship at Children's Hospital in Boston, Harvard Medical School. She also obtained a Master of Science in Physiology and a PhD in Genetics. Her research projects are uh, conducted at the Imagine Institute uh, in Paris and focus on genetic basis, pathophysiology and treatment of nephrotic syndrome and on pharmacokinetics of offering drugs in rare diseases. Professor Olivia Boyer is the chair of the ArtNet Guidelines of and Best Practice uh, Task Force. She's the chair of the IPNA Guideline and Best Practice Committee and a board member of the ESPN Glomeropathy Working Group and of the ESPN Educational Committee. The title of our lecture today is Congenital Nephrotic Syndrome. Please, Olivia. Thank you very much, Francesco, for the kind introduction. It's always a pleasure to give these ACNET webinars. So let's start with a little of background. Congenital nephrotic syndrome is characterized by nephrotic range proteinuria and edema that manifests in utero or during the first three months of life, rarely caused by congenital infections or maternal alloimmune diseases. The main causes are pathogenic variants of podocyte genes, with NPHS1 variants uh, being the uh, major cause of CNF manifesting before the age of one month, and NPHS2 variants being the second cause of CNS and the first cause of uh, um, cases manifesting after the age of one month. So, the prenatal features include enlarged hyperechoic kidneys, increased alpha fetoprotein in the amniotic fluid and the maternal blood, and large placenta that may weigh up to 25% of the uh, child body weight uh, at birth, and uh, massive proteinuria, anazarca, and variable kidney function at birth depending on the underlying etiology. Histology is also variable depending on the etiology, with tubular dilation, mesangial matrix expansions and sclerosis in Finnish type congenital nephrotic syndrome, or minimal change disease, FSGS, or diffuse mesangial sclerosis. So as you may all know, these children are prone to severe and life-threatening complications, such as hemodynamic instability, recurrent infections, thrombosis, impaired growth, and most progress to kidney failure within a few years. And in the 60s, the mean survival of these children was around seven months, from zero to 26, with most uh, infants dying owing to infection, hemodynamic collapse, or thrombosis. This congenital nephrotic syndrome was initially referred to as the Finnish type nephrotic syndrome due to its high inf incidence in Finland with one uh, over 8,000 live births, with two NPHS1 founder variants called Finn major and Finn minor underlying most cases. And this disease was later reported worldwide with more than 200 rare uh, variants found in the non Finnish population along with other gene variants. In the 80s, an aggressive management was proposed, including daily albumin infusion on the central velus line, prevention and management of comorbidities, and preemptive bilateral nephrectomy when the child's weight was around 7 kilos, although the GFR was usually normal at that time, Dial uh, peritoneal dialysis, and kidney transplantation when the uh, body weight was around 9 kilos at around 1 year of age. And this led to a tremendous improvement in life expectancy with more than 90% of children who could be transplanted with similar renal and overall survival to other transplanted children as um, 
you can see here on the patient and graph survival showed uh, from the ESPN era EDTR registry. More recent data uh, demonstrated the successful treatment using a more conservative approach without present preventive nephrectomies involving optimized nutrition and medications. And acknowledging that uh, there was no international guideline on the management of CNS, the ERCnet and ESPN working groups embarked in an initiative with a core group of several pediatric nephrologists and geneticists from uh, several uh, centers of the ERCnet and ESPN um, uh, groups, including uh, the, those ones that you can see here in the figure, one uh, neonatologist, one pediatric nephrology nurse, and one patient representative. And we used the Delphi method and followed the right statement. And these recommendations were sent to an external expert group of several pediatric nephrologists from uh, Europe and the rest of the world, including Francesco Emma, our moderator today, and also an adult nephrologist, a pediatric endocrinologist, another neonatologist, a pharmacologist, an ethicist, and patient representative and nurses. And once uh, uh, an agreement was achieved with the external expert group, uh, the recommendations were sent to an external voting panel, again using this Delphi method. So the evidence review was performed by uh, Tanya Vlodkovsky from ERCnet on 27 relevant PICO questions and yielded more, more than 1,000 results, but no randomized controlled trials and uh, 54 of them are referenced in the consensus treatment. We uh, aim to grade this recommendation according to the American Academic of Pediatric Grading System, but most of the recommendations were graded level X because there was no uh, 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 quality evidence uh, available. So these recommendations are published in two parts one focusing specifically on the genetic aspects of congenital nephrotic syndrome, which has been published uh, this year uh, in the European Journal of Human Genetics and has been led by Beata Lipska and Fatio Zaltin and is freely downloadable at the journal site. And another one on the management uh, of the children, which is in press in Nature Reviews Nephrology and has been formally accepted for publication yesterday. So as a preliminary remark, I would like to pinpoint that it was not possible to write a unique treatment protocol suitable for all children. Since congenital nephrotic syndrome encompasses a wide spectrum of clinical phenotypes that should be managed with different and adapted approaches. Indeed, some patients will present with no or minimal symptoms, and in these patients, the aim of the treatment is to avoid aggressive and potentially dangerous treatments. On the opposite, some patients present with massive anazarca and uh, prolonged hemodynamic compromise, and these one may require daily albumin infusions via a central venous line and intensive systematic, symptomatic measures to avoid complications. Therefore, the management should be adapted to the clinical severity of the condition with the aim of maintaining intravascular uvolemia and adequate nutrition, as well as preventing complications. Once again, as no conclusive clinical data are available, such as the results of randomized controlled trial, we propose an opinion-based clinical practice recommendation and management algorithm for children with CNS. And here is the algorithm we propose, and I will guide you uh, through it step by step. So first of all, we recommend that all patients with congenital nephrotic syndrome are referred to a specialized teams in tertiary pediatric nephrology centers and managed by a multidisciplinary team, including neonatologists, pediatric nephrologists, and pediatric nephrology nurses, pediatric renal dietitians, which are very helpful, pediatric surgeon, child and youth uh, psychologists and social workers, and all these uh, people should be trained for child care. When children are managed outside of a transplant facility, we recommend that they are introduced to a transplant center early at their CKD progresses in order to minimize the time on dialysis and facilitate, facilitate the transplantation. 
response with CNS, we recommend performing the initial diagnosis workup as presenting in this slide, including a family history of consanguinity of CNS, the perinatal history of increased amniotic fluid alpha fetoprotein, fetal edema, oligohydramnos, the weight of the placenta, and patient history. And of course, the uh, growth chart, blood pressure, and physical examination to assess volemia and edema, uh, biochemistry, and thyroid hormones, IgG, uh, calcium and phosphate metabolism, ultrasound of the abdomen and cardiac ultrasound, and an assessment and advice from a renal dietitian on salt, potassium, calorie, and protein intake. We also recommend uh, extended evaluation uh, in order to uh, uh, look for uh, extra-renal um, features of uh, genetic forms of congenital nephrotic syndrome and also to look for non-genetic causes of congenital nephrotic syndrome. So we recommend evaluating dysmorphic features and skeletal abnormalities, genital examination, uh, for instance, uh, to look for Dennis Drash syndrome, ophthalmological examination for Pearson syndrome and mitochondrial diseases, hearing tests, full neurological examination, and brain MRI uh, in case of clinical suspicion. We also recommend checking the serologies for congenital infections if the mother of the infant has not already been screened for this infection. And we recommend further screening in selected endemic areas or in case of clinical suspicion for malaria, uh, autoimmune diseases such as antineutral endopeptidase antibodies that we will discuss later on, amino acids and or mercury levels. So in every patient, we recommend a comprehensive genetic screening comprising all podocytopathy related genes as a first line diagnostic measure um, and also of course providing genetic counseling promptly. And in congenital nephrotic syndrome, the basic genetic screening for NPHS1, NPHS2, WT1, and laminin beta2 will uncover the underlying genetic anomalies in more than 80% of cases. However, due to the wide range of phenotypic, the phenotypic variability and genetic heterogeneity, we recommend comprehensive genetic screening uh, by uh, next generation sequencing techniques such as walling zoom sequencing or uh, panel screening. However, if there is a population-specific genetic abnormality, such as uh, NPHS1 mutation in Finland, um, it is suitable to start uh, with a specific genetic uh, screening and uh, to um, uh, test with NGS in case of negative results. Similarly, if there is a clear uh, phenotype suggestive for a specific gene, uh, the first step can be um, a specific genetic screening of this gene, such as in Dennis Rush syndrome, and um, NGS uh, assessment in case of uh, negative results. And then, if, N if NGS is not available at the center, uh, because uh, more than 80% of the mutation uh, will uh, be in NPHS1, 2, laminin beta 2, and WT1 genes. Uh, one uh, option can be to uh, start screening for this gene by Sanger sequencing and then um, perform uh, uh, NGS in case of uh, negative results. And this is a nice algorithm proposed by uh, Beata and Fatih uh, in the um, genetic uh, guideline. Additionally, we recommend karyotype testing to be performed in children with ambiguous genitalia and also in phenotypic female with a causative WT1 variant of Dennis Rush syndrome. Establishing the chromosomal gender uh, is necessary proper uh, management, including the endocrine and oncological follow-up in particular. We recommend evaluation formation, biological surveillance for Wimps tumor and gonadoblastoma, and uh, especially children with exonic variants should be uh, monitored for Wilms tumor with an abdominal ultrasound performed every three months until the age of seven years. 
And after reaching end-stage kidney disease, we recommend bilateral nephrectomy uh, to prevent the development of Wilms tumor, in particular in uh, children carrying truncating variants. And in the phenotypic girls uh, carrying a, a 46XY karyotype uh, with complete gonadal degenesis, we recommend bilateral gonadectomy due to the increased risk of gonato gonadoblastoma and, of course, uh, non-docrine management. So um, the recommendation for, other, for the management of these genetic forms, uh, the vast majority of these children uh, will not respond to standard steroid treatment nor to intensified immunosuppressive treatment. Although very uh, rare case reports have been uh, published of um, partial remission and even uh, re more rarely uh, of a complete remission, but the vast majority of these children will not benefit from uh, immunosuppressive regimen. Uh, which uh, will be um, dangerous for them. And therefore, we do not recommend to use this immunosuppressive treatment, but to use RAS blockades and the rest of the uh, general management that I will detail in the next few slides. For children with NPHS2 variants, we recommend cardiac evaluation since uh, cardiac anomalies have been observed uh, with uh, uh, several variants. In children with uh, coenzyme Q10 related mitochondriopathies with variants in uh, several genes, we recommend complete and repeated screening from, for extrarenal manifestation. And in case uh, of a negative genetic result, muscle or skin biopsy may be helpful for measuring the mitochondrial enzyme activity and also kidney biopsies with uh, electron microscopy to analyze uh, quantitatively and qualitatively the mitochondria. In these children, uh, some reports have uh, demonstrated the, the efficiency of con early coenzyme Q10 supplementation at high doses uh, uh, on uh, the improvement of proteinuria and some neuro neuro neuromuscular complaints. Uh, so uh, we rec recommend uh, uh, early introduction of this uh, treatment. And of note, the leukocyte coenzyme Q10 levels can be normal and uh, is not uh, completely helpful for monitoring therapy. In case of Ladminin beta 2 variants, uh, we recommend a detailed ophthalmological examination. And in case of HGPL1 variant, investigation of adrenal insufficiency. So as the genetic screening will identify the underlying genetic abnormality in uh, more than 85% of the patients, the non-invasive molecular diagnostic methods have largely replaced the kidney biopsy in this patient. And therefore, we do not recommend routine kidney biopsy in children with congenital nephrotic syndrome. But we suggest to consider it only in patients with sporadic non syndromic disease in whom the comprehensive genetic testing has not yielded a molecular diagnosis. So um, what, is now, what are now the recommendations for management of non-genetic forms of congenital nephrotic syndrome? So as we said earlier, we do not recommend using immunosuppressive drugs to treat children with congenital nephrotic syndrome. However, it is comprehensive genetic testing and screening for secondary forms have yielded negative results. A kidney biopsy and a trial of immunosuppressive therapy may be considered in selective cases. We also uh, suggest considering congenital membranous nephropathy due to uh, anti-NEP antibodies. And the clinical features subjective of these rare diseases are uh, children who have kidney failure at presentation, transient proteinuria that resolve spontaneously, or uh, past history of siblings with transient proteinuria. We also provide guidance for the treatment of infection-related congenital nephrotic syndrome with uh, antimicrobial agents, uh, such as the doses for penicillin G uh, for congenital syphilis, or the dosage and monitoring of uh, Biclovir and bicosanclovir uh, in case of CMV infection. And we also recommend performing genetic screening with these patients because uh, some, re some uh, uh, publications have reported uh, children who had both uh, um, CMV infection and a causative uh, mutation. 
So to sum up this part, uh, in the initial presentation, we recommend clinical and biological assessment by a specialized team with infectious screening and genetic testing. And while waiting for the uh, genetic result, uh, rec recommend to uh, treat the children as a presumed genetic form of congenital necrotic syndrome, to treat uh, children with infectious, infection related CNS with a specific treatment. And if uh, the screening for um, infection and the genetic screening are negative to consider a kidney biopsy and a trial of immunosuppressive therapy. So let's move on to the general uh, management. So we recommend rapid referral of all children with congenital nephrotic syndrome to a specialized pediatric nephrology unit. And given the wide variation in clinical findings, we recommend individualized therapy with a number of key objectives, which are the following. First of all, to preserve all central and peripheral arteries and veins for potential dialysis access in the future and avoid peripherally inserted catheter and unnecessary vein punctures, to optimize nutrition, fluids, protein, and cal cal caloric intake and minimize uh, administration of salt, prevent thrombosis and treat infection when clinically suspected by starting empiric antibiotics before culture results are available. So when possible, we recommend avoiding central venous lines in children with CNS due to the high risk of thrombosis that may affect all arteries, all veins, uh, such as here, uh, thrombosis of the left brachiocephalic trunk in an infant with CNS, or here, prenatal ischemic cerebral accident in another infant. If a central venous vein is required for albumin infusion, we recommend administering prophylactic anticoagulation, and we also recommend general vascular preservation for, for hemodialysis access, uh, and especially for a future AV fistula. We recommend avoiding um, uh, intravenous fluids and saline, and the fluid prescription should be primarily used to provide adequate nutrition, and when necessary and feasible, we recommend using concentrated high-calorie formulas uh, with the help and advice from expert renal dietitian. We also recommend assessing the volume status of the child, uh, being underfilled versus overfilled, prescribing salt restriction and fluid restriction in case of hyponatremia and in the most severe cases of edema. As we will see later on, intravenous albumin is the treatment of choice for acute symptomatic hypovolemia. So the main debated recommendation was on albumin, and therefore I decided to write on the slide the exact formulation that we agreed on with the core group and the experts. So we recommend using albumin infusions based on clinical indicators of hypovolemia, including oliguria, AKI, prolonged capillary refill time, tachycardia, hypotension and abdominal discomfort, or upon failure to thrive. And we do not recommend administering albumin infusions in children with congenital nephrotic syndrome based on albumin uh, levels on So, so, as you know, and as we discussed in the introduction, some centers do administer IV albumin only when deemed clinically indicated, whereas others use regular albumin infusion protocols. The potential advantages of regular albumin infusions to support growth in development, stab in volume, and minimum. The disadvantage is the need for balloon line, increase of infection and thrombosis that may injure future hemodialysis access, the prolonged hospitalization and associated impacts on quality of So, what literature? 
as production, two larger series have been published in end 2018. First, the French nationwide retrospective study that including 55 consecutive children born in the 20s. And the second one uh, is a retrospective review across 22 centers um, uh, among the members of the ESPN dialysis working group, that uh, including uh, 80 children uh, diagnosed after um, uh, uh, 2010. So, as you can see, in both series, one or two patients did not receive albumin infusion at all. And in the French series, the uh, dosage and frequency of uh, albumin infusion could be uh, spaced down. And even in 80% of the children, albumin infusion could be uh, discontinuated, although the children had a normal EGFR and stable clinical biological features at a median age of 11 months and for a median duration of 26 months. Similarly, in the European cohort, they observed a 70% increase in serum albumin levels after introduction of ACE inhibitors, and they could reduce the weekly albumin infusion dose by one gram per kilogram per week. Additionally, in a single center in the UK, albumin infusion were decreased and subsequently discontinued in five of the seven children. Uh, although uh, uh, they, they were in stable clinical biological uh, status with a, a good albumin level. And there are also few case, report, case reports of spontaneous remission, including children with uh, causative NPHS1 mutation from 11 days of life to uh, 10 months of age. So, uh, interestingly, in the report from uh, Newcastle, uh, they developed a parental education program of home IV albumin administration via a central venous line, as we can do, for instance, uh, with uh, uh, parental nutrition. And this allowed a reduction in the hospital stay. Uh, and uh, once again, they could uh, uh, report a discontinuation uh, of the albumin infusion in five of the several children with ACE inhibitors and indomethacin, but uh, not with any uh, nephrectomy. And uh, of note, none of these children uh, presented any uh, line sepsis. In the European cohort, 20% of the children also received their albumin at home. And in the French cohort, uh, one third of the patient could be uh, discharged and managed ambulatorily before uh, reaching end-stage kidney disease at a median age of eight months. And similar results were observed in a, a Spanish center where, where they observed less, uh, hospitali less uh, uh, days of hospitalization during the pre-end-stage uh, kidney disease period as opposed to the uh, dialysis period. So the ambulatory management is possible before nephrectomy. Moreover, most of the infused albumin is lost in the urine within hours. And therefore, the purpose of albumin infusion is not to normalize serum albumin levels, but rather to support intravascular volume and to reduce extravascular fluid retention in patients with symptomatic hypovolemia. So once again, some children may have no or minimal symptom and do well without regular albumin infusions, but others may need frequent albumin infusion to prevent the clinical consequences of hypovolemia and failure to thrive. And in these later patients, we recommend basing the frequency and dosage of albumin infusion on the clinical indicators of hypovolemia rather than on serum albumin levels. This patient may receive up to one to four grams per kilograms uh, per day of uh, albumin at initiation. And in stable patients or when CKD progresses, this albumin dose may be reduced and infusions might be subsequently uh, um, placed out or even stopped. If albumin infusions are given, we suggest administering a dose of furosemide at the end of each infusion, unless the patient has marked hypovolemia or hyponatremia. And we also recommend using diuretics in patients with signs of intravascular fluid overload and preserved kidney function. We provide the dosages of uh, furosemide depending on uh, the age. And uh, we propose to um, infuse furosemide over 5 to 30 minutes to minimize autotoxicity. 
We also recommend administrating RAS blocking therapy, such as ACE inhibitors or ARBs, uh, after the age of four weeks. And we suggest starting with a short acting captopril uh, in escalating dosage depending on the uh, age of the children, of the child. But we do not recommend combining ACE inhibitors and ARBs due to the increased risk of AKI. In the case of poor responsiveness to this therapy, we also suggest considering adding indomethacin with incremental uh, dosages, and we recommend stopping this treatment if no clinical benefits, such as increased albumin level or decreased edema, is apparent after two to four weeks. And of course, in case of vomiting of diarrhea, RAS inhibitors, indomethacin and diuretics must be stopped due to the high risk of intravascular volume depletion and AKI. So to summarize the second part, the initial management should be performed in a specialized pediatric nephrology unit with several aims. Uh, that are avoid unnecessary fluid and salt intake, optimize nutrition, avoid a central venous line when uh, possible. And we may face several uh, situations. In case of intravascular hypovolemia or failure to thrive, we recommend albumin infusions together with the general measures. In case of severe edema, we recommend furosemide and to consider albumin infusions uh, together with other general uh, measures. And in case of moderate edema, to avoid central venous line and consider oral diuretics. So then we do recommend performing routine early nephrectomies in these children. And again, retrospective studies did not find any difference in the long-term outcomes of uh, children with these two strategies. So in the two um, uh, studies that I introduced uh, earlier on, the French one and the uh, European one, the uh, 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 children uh, could be managed either with preemptive um, bilateral nephrectomy or with um, conservative management. In the French cohort, most of the children were managed conservatively with um, a median age at its and stage kidney disease of uh, 54 months. And therefore, it was difficult to really compare the outcome between the two uh, protocols. And in the European cohort, um, uh, they could compare really the uh, conservative management with the preemptive bilateral uh, nephrectomy protocol. So one might argue that the rate of complications secondary to ongoing nephrosis uh, may be higher in children not undergoing nephrectomy and dialysis. However, these two uh, recent series showed either um, reduced rate of complication as compared to the uh, historical uh, literature. Uh, and also in the European cohort, you can see that really there was no difference in the rate of uh, central venous line infection and septic episode, nor in the rate of uh, CNS-related thrombosis. The mortality was also uh, not increased in such patients, and as you can see here in the French cohort, two children only died of a septic shock in the conservative management, as opposed to 20% when reaching end-stage kidney disease and renal replacement therapy. And this was uh, also uh, described in the ESPN era EDTA registry, where 10% uh, of the children died while on dialysis, highlighting the major uh, burden, um, uh, morbidity and mortality of dialysis in uh, such a small baby. The European cohort they could also assess the uh, final height at uh, three years of age and showed no difference in the height in the group uh, with bilateral nephrectomy and in the group with the conservative management. So therefore, we do not recommend performing routine early nephrectomies in all children with CNS, but we suggest considering unilateral or bilateral nephrectomy in patients with severe complications, including failure to thrive, thrombosis, or difficulty in maintaining uh, euvolemia despite optimization of the conservative treatment. However, we recommend performing bilateral nephrectomies before transplantation in 
patient in the CKD stage 5 with persisting nephrotic syndrome and or with a WT1 dominant pathogenic variant to avoid the risk of uh, Wilms tumor. And when possible, we recommend ambulatory management to increase quality of life, decrease the risk of nosocomial infection and re reduce the costs. So uh, this is uh, summarized in this uh, slide. So the follow-up should be uh, done by a multidisciplinary team. In case of persistent severe CNS, consider nephrectomy. But if the child has a stable status, consider ambulatory management, spacing out or stopping albumin infusions if given. And uh, we also recommend an early referral to a transplant unit as the CKD progressive and bilateral nephrectomy at the time of CKD stage 5 if persistent nephrotic syndrome or in case of WT1 pathogenic variant. So now to finish, uh, recommendation, uh, the, um, let's talk uh, about the prevention of complications. So we recommend preventive anticoagulation during the states of increased thrombosis risk, such as uh, inserted central lines or dehydration, and or in case of uh, prior thrombosis. And we do not recommend antibiotic prophylaxis, but prompt antibiotics if suspected bacterial infection, because once again, this was the major cause of death uh, in these uh, children. We recommend IVIGs in patients with low levels and uh, recurrent or severe infections, uh, as also recommended in other causes of uh, hypogammaglobulinemia. We recommend vaccinations at large, including vaccinating against encapsulated bacteria and varicella and uh, the annual flu vaccine. And in the case of exposure to chickenpox, which can be uh, dreadful and fatal in these children, uh, we recommend uh, specific visit V IVIGs or oral acyclovir uh, for five to seven days, starting within 10 days of exposure. And if the child develops a visit ZV infection, we recommend high, v, uh, high doses of acyclovir. We also uh, recommend uh, a high energy diet and a high uh, protein uh, diet, but a low salt content, and this uh, with the help of a specialized uh, renal dietitian. We also recommend initiated growth hormone treatment in patients with persistent growth failure despite adequate nutrition, supplementing with uh, levothyroxine in case of uh, hypothyroidism, and supplementing with calcium and vitamin D, depending on the uh, um, calcium and phosphate metabolism. But uh, today, there is insufficient evidence to recommend uh, lipid-lowering lower drugs in such small babies. About anemia prevention, we recommend monitoring and treating iron deficiency and administering EPO in patients who have uh, anemia despite a good iron stock. And we recommend close monitoring of uh, reticulocyte as a marker of erythropoiesis. And in case of persistent anemia, we suggest to uh, search for contributing factors such as copper, cell celluloplasmin, or vitamin B12 deficiency that may also be in a, uh, lost in the urine and uh, give appropriate treatment. So for the management of end-stage kidney disease, we recommend uh, to follow the general guideline for kidney replacement therapy. And uh, we um, specify that uh, uh, genetic counseling should be given prior to parental kidney donation in genetic forms. And that carriers of heterozygous variants in an autosomal recessively inherited gene can be kidney donors. But bear in mind that there is a large intra and interfamily variability, an edge-dependent penetrance, especially with, with WT1 and NPHS2 genes that should be taken into account. And in children with post-transplant proteinuria, we recommend considering antibody-mediated disease. However, uh, proteinuria is not rare after kidney transplantation and can be related to graft rejection, infection, or drug toxicity that should be uh, assessed. And of note, almost all de novo glomerulopathy uh, are observed in children with fin major NPH1, NPH1 
NPH1 variants, and uh, indeed occurs in uh, 25 to 35 percent of these children, uh, of whom 70 percent have detectable antinephrine antibodies. In such ch children, uh, daily plasma exchanges, methylprednisolone pulses, and oral uh, cyclophosphamide or rituximide may be um, efficient. And a few uh, cases were reported with NPHS2 variants, but no antibodies were identified, and the pathophysiology of this recurrence might be multifactorial. So here is the uh, whole algorithm, and once again, I want to uh, highlight that uh, uh, we recommend multidisciplinary team management uh, with prompt uh, genetic screening in all children and genetic counseling of their families. We do not recommend um, routine kidney biopsy, uh, but uh, to perform it in case of uh, uh, negative genetic and infectious uh, screening. We also uh, recommend to uh, manage the children in specialized uh, units and to really base the treatment uh, uh, on the clinical uh, parameters and to provide all general measures and uh, to uh, uh, consider, consider nephrectomies only in case of persistent hypovolemia or complication of uh, ongoing uh, congenital nephrotic syndrome or at the time of kidney failure in case of persistent nephrotic syndrome or WT1 pathogenic variants. So I would like to thank uh, all my uh, colleagues and friends uh, for, from the core group uh, with which it was a pleasure to work on these guidelines and I really uh, do miss a lot. Uh, and I would like also to thank the external expert group and external voting panel for very interesting and fruitful uh, discussion and uh, you for your attention. And before uh, taking your question, uh, we will have a poll with two multiple choice uh, questions. So, I will read them out loud for you. So, how would you manage a 16 months old infant with congenital nephrotic syndrome and two NPHS1 compound heterozygous variants with slight lower limb edema? and satisfactory growth with a weight of 9.5 kilo, few ENT infections, and a serum creatinine of 25 micromoles per liter, uh, which is 0.3 milligrams per deciliter, receiving the following treatment. Two weekly albumin infusions, captopril, warfarin, calcium, and vitamin D. And the proposition are the following. A, bilateral nephrectomy and peritoneal dialysis. B, preemptive kidney transplantation. C, hospital discharge and ambulatory management. D, unilateral nephrectomy and add indomethacin. And E, transfer to a long stay center for children. So please, Stephanie, can you uh, launch the poll? So I don't see the responses, but maybe you can um, uh, stop when uh, 70 or 80 percent of people have voted. Okay, good. <laughs> so it was tricky because I'm not sure that the question were, were in the right order, but. Um, I'm very glad to see that uh, we have convinced you that uh, in such a child with a, um, a good uh, evolution and stable status with a conservative management, uh, there's no need at the moment to perform uh, preemptive bilateral nephrectomy and dialysis, but rather to uh, manage th this child ambulatorily uh, uh, with uh, uh, ongoing conservative care. So the second uh, question is the following. 
So you are following a nine month old girl with congenital nephrotic syndrome whose treatment is on a central venous line, uh, two weekly albumin infusions and IVIG once a week and orally warfarin, captopril, L-tyroxine, vitamin D and calcium. And she consults for a fever of 38.5 degrees, well tolerated. The examination is unremarkable apart from an acute right otitis media. So what is your immediate therapeutic attitude? A, return home antipyretics and monitoring. B, return home antipyretics and amoxicillin. C, paracentesis antipyretics and adapted oral antibiotics at home. D, hospitalization antipyretics and clinical monitoring. E, hospitalization antipyretics, blood and urine tests and IV antibiotics. So please, Stephanie, can you launch the poll? Meanwhile, um, Olivia, I will just tell you while people are responding that um, we are running short of time and there are questions, so probably we should um, run the poll uh, quickly to allow some questions. Sure. So can we see the, the response? So great. So the main message of this uh, question was really that these patients have a central venous line. So even the, if they have otitis media, they uh, should be uh, managed as a, uh, um, a, a CVL-related infection with at least uh, hospitalization, uh, blood and urine tests, and IV antibiotics uh, either uh, immediately or after the result of this test. So I would like to announce the next webinar, which will be uh, done by uh, Professor Pierre Ronco, which is, who is uh, a well-renowned specialist of uh, membranous nephropathy, an adult nephrologist, and I'll be happy to take some questions. Okay, so thank you very much, Olivia. This was very mindful and uh, a wonderful webinar. Um, and before I ask you the question, let me also uh, correct myself. This was a webinar that was also sponsored by the ESPN and by IPNA, which I failed to recognize in the beginning. So um, let me uh, first uh, maybe start um, as the questions are coming in um, to ask you to comment on the, the exact role of the IVIGs in patients that have massive proteinuria, uh, which inevitably would lose most of the immunoglobulins that you're infusion. Do you want to comment on that? Yes, so there is no uh, specific uh, data on the role of, uh, on the efficiency of IVIG or indication in patients with congenital nephrotic syndrome. But we base our recommendation on a general guideline for uh, uh, hypoglobulinemia of uh, other causes. And it is recommended to give um, uh, IVIG supplementation in case of low levels plus recurrent or severe infections, but not in, in all uh, children. So, um, um, Linda Costa Confuse is asking you, is there a place for ACE inhibitors um, in infants above three months? I think you already answered that. In infants, Below four weeks or in no, infants uh, above? infants above three months, which I think... Uh, so I don't know if the question refers yes. to enalapril or to the ACE inhibitors in general, but I think you gave an answer already. Sure, so uh, uh, obviously uh, all children, we, we recommend using ACE inhibitors or ARBs in all children after the age of four weeks before, because beforehand we uh, believe that there is a risk of um, um, inhibiting the role of uh, RAS in the uh, growing uh, renal tissue. Uh, but in a stable patient who has uh, no uh, problem of uh, hypovolemia, we recommend starting ACE inhibitors with the short uh, acting uh, ACE inhibitors so that if there is an acute problem or hypovolemia, uh, you 
stop the effect quickly, but in a stable patient, of course, you can uh, introduce enalapril. Okay, so the, she, while you were answering, she actually um, um, reformulated her question. The question is if captopril is mandatory or can we use enalapril instead of captopril? Yes, sure. Okay, so Dr. Dorsen is asking you uh, whether we can use ibuprofen instead of uh, indomethacin, if there is intolerance to indomethacin. Yes, yes, so we provide a table uh, with uh, different uh, possible uh, um, NSAIDs uh, uh, possible in, in these children. All right. Thank you, Olivia. Dr. Sinha is asking you whether the genotype can guide you in the choice of medication, and if so, how? Unfortunately not. Uh, in the two most recent uh, uh, retrospective studies, uh, we tried to identify phenotype to genotype correlation, and uh, uh, both studies found that there was no uh, good uh, correlation to guide the, the management. What we can only say is that probably the children with fin major and fin minor uh, mutation have really the, the most massive uh, congenital nephrotic syndrome with massive proteinuria and uh, clinical consequences. And with discuss when discussing with uh, Tula, Olta, uh, Yanou, uh, Halanko and, and, and the other uh, Finnish colleagues, they say that in these children, uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, uh, NSAIDs, etc., do not have a lot of effect. But in the other population, um, we couldn't find good um, uh, clinical to uh, um, correlation to guide the, the management. All right. So um, you, 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 you've in partly already answered the question, but uh, Dr. K is asking you uh, whether you use um, routinely thrombosis prophylaxis in our patient with congenital nephrotic syndrome or in a selected group of patients only, and I think you already answered this. And if so, what is your preferred agent, low molecular weight heparin or aspirin? Um... So, um, both have uh, advantages and uh, pitfalls. Um, wh what has been mostly published is uh, low molecular weight heparin followed by uh, warfarin, and that's what we use at my center because uh, uh, we have the coagut check, which, which is very easy to, uh, to use with uh, um, uh, finger uh, blood uh, check for uh, uh, INR assessment and so on. Um, but, you know, once again, there is no uh, good evidence, so uh, it would not be, um, uh, it would be possible to, to use aspirin also. Dr. Uh, Flamia is asking you, at what age do you perform gonadectomy in XY girls with WT1 mutation? Yeah, because of the risk of uh, gonadoblastoma and because these uh, uh, gonads are not uh, functioning. Actually, uh, Olivia, it's not uh, why, but it's at what age do you do the, gonad, uh, the oh. gonadectomy? Um, usually, we, we do it uh, at the, the time of another surgery, uh, such as when we uh, when we do nephrectomy or uh, at the time of end stage kidney disease. All right. So I think that your answer was that um, you usually take advantage Hello? of another surgery. Because we didn't hear you very well, uh, but um, just to repeat your answer, I think what you answer is that you usually take yeah. advantage of another surgery to perform at the same time the gonadectomy, right? But exactly that, that's right. We don't hear you well, Olivia. Unfortunately, your voice comes and goes. Um, 
let me try to see if I can um, if I can, can you ask hear me now. <laughs> now, yes, but not before. Okay, let me ask you. So, okay. please, um, to everybody, stop uh, sending in questions because uh, we have very few minutes left, and I will not have the time to um, to to send more questions. So, please stop sending in questions. So let me try to ask you quickly a few more questions. Instead of IVIG, can subcutaneous uh, IG be used? I think that's a good idea, but it hasn't been uh, published, but uh, I think it would be a good idea, right? Uh, with the aim of obtaining a trough level above uh, six grams per liter or something like that. But, you know, there is no literature on that topic. It looks like the captopril uh, recommendation raised a lot of questions because there is another one um, um, asking that, uh, you said that captopril is short act actin. Um, what do you think about other ACE inhibitors such as ramipril? Uh, we uh, recommend to use all these agents in monotherapy and we provide the recommended dosage for uh, young babies with all these drugs. But, uh, you know, we, we had to recommend one. It was requested by the reviewers, so we recommend this one, but I think that all are uh, uh, possible. Just be careful with the long-lasting one because if there is a complication, AKI or hyperkalemia or so on, uh, the, the effect of the drug uh, may last longer. Okay, then um, you've also asked, been asked uh, what is the um, optimal age to start in the medicine? To start all medicine or RAS blockade? No, in the medicine, in the medicine. Oh, indomethacin. Yes, so right, pr probably after the first month also. And what we recommend is to first start uh, race inhibitors. And if there is no major improvement after uh, uh, three to four weeks, to uh, introduce indomethacin. Okay, and, and just to uh, also clear another question, so you have been asked whether you can combine ACE inhibitors and indomethacin, and I think you just answered, right? Yes, right. We can combine, but we do not recommend combining ACE and ARBs. And then I don't understand the last question, which, uh, which um, it, it reads as follows. Will you do a biopsy for those patients with congenital nephrotic syndrome or genetic is enough? Um, I don't really understand the question. I think, Olivia, uh, your lecture was brilliant. I think we've learned a lot. Um, I need to close the questions because we're running out of time. Um, and before closing, um, I would also like to invite you again on December 15 to join us for the lecture of Pierre Ronco on membranous nephropathy. And to you, um, Olivia, thank you again for this wonderful lecture. Thank you, Francesco. Bye. Bye.